move to the next speaker, uh, Sven Batagis uh, from Hillis, who will speak uh, just about biomarkers of aging. Okay, um, you can see my screen, I guess. Okay, so, um, well, thanks to the organizers, I will say that I was one of the organizers. <laughs> Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, today about biomarkers. Um, oops. Why am I not? Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I work at the Bradman Lab uh, in Ghent University, but my uh, research is a collaboration with the biotech company Rejuvenate Biomed, uh, and we are funded by the Agency of Innovation and Entrepreneurship. Um, um, so I shall disclose first that my views expressed in this presentation are my own and they do not reflect necessarily the views of the company. So first I'm going to talk about actually the thing I'm uh, specialized in, that's how to discover uh, new drugs on aging. Uh, I was asked to talk about biomarkers, which I admit is not my field, but I'm going to do an, uh, a trial here to talk about them. Uh, I'm going to talk first about what biomarkers are. I'm going to look a little bit at how the field is evolving, and then I'm going to uh, look at one specific biomarker of aging uh, and then come to a conclusion. So uh, how do you discover new drugs involved in aging? Uh, well, traditionally, we can say there are two very main big paradigms. On the one hand, you have the phenotypic screening, and the, on the other hand, you have the target-based screening. Now, there are other paradigms as well, such as in silico screening, where you could, for example, look at the differences in the gene uh, expression pattern between young and old and see if there is a compound that shifts the gene expression profile uh, more towards that of a young uh, uh, cell. Um, but uh, mainly I'm going to just focus on these two. Uh, so in phenotypic screening, that's the classical way in how you do the screening uh, that was uh, used uh, 100 years already ago. Um, to discover the first uh, drugs in humans. Uh, and so um, uh, the mice has always been kind of the organism which most of this work was done. But uh, these days, phenotypic screening is mostly happening in cells. And also work on uh, aging has been done in cells, but not that many screenings. One example was a recent screening uh, by Cynthia Kenyon, where uh, they looked at 100,000 compounds in cells. And they looked for compounds that increased oxidative stress resistance. Uh, they found 32 uh, main hits that were then validated uh, in C. elegans, and they found nine compounds that extended the lifespan in C. elegans by between 10 and uh, 50%. Also, of course, analytics have been uh, checked and, and, and found through screenings in uh, cells. Uh, C. elegans has been really one of those organisms that is very strongly upcoming, and as I will show, actually, it is the most uh, used organism for drug screening in, in uh, for geoprotective drugs. Um, uh, but also target-based approaches have been used, not that often, but a few of them exist. Uh, for example, of course, we probably all know about the sir 2 in one uh, activating compounds uh, that were discovered uh, uh, using target-based screenings, but also, for example, inhibitors of CD38 uh, have been discovered. Uh, and when uh, one of those compounds that GSK developed was given to mice, it was shown to improve the health of elderly mice, including an improvement of uh, glucose tolerance, muscle function, and cardiac function. So when we look at the drug age database, uh, we can see that there are almost 600 uh, unique compounds that have been uh, screened that are in the database. Uh, by the way, the database is probably not complete, but it's much uh, almost complete, I will say. Uh, and about 70% of uh, all the compounds in the database have been screened in C. elegans. Uh, the second most popular uh, model is the fruit fly with about 23%, followed by the mice with 10%. By the way, this doesn't add up to 100% because, of course, some compounds have been screened in more than one organism, luckily. However, uh, not that many compounds, surprisingly. So uh, I have, uh, in analogy with uh, uh, genetics, where you talk about forward and reverse genetics, I have called it forward screening and reverse screening. Forward screening being you start with C. elegans, you 
uh, Drosophila cells. Uh, and when you find hits, you then move them to the mice. From the mice, you move them to dogs, to primates, for example. And finally, of course, the goal is to move them to humans. Reverse screening is when you have hits in higher organisms, and that has only been in mice, and you then move them to simpler models. Now, surprisingly, when you look uh, to the, the drug age database, there are very few drugs that you can find that were discovered in uh, C. elegans and Drosophila and were then moved to the mice. Uh, so these three compounds uh, are the ones that I found. There might be a few more, but not many. Uh, in many more cases, you actually see the opposite. Drugs were first discovered in the mice. Uh, and a nice example here is metformin, which was discovered in the 1980s by Dillman and Anisimov. Uh, well, back then it was uh, fentformin actually that they first discovered, but later they also screened metformin and bifurmin uh, in mice, and it was found to extend lifespan. Yet it took until 2002 before uh, bifurmin was first tested in C. elegans, and actually 2010 before metformin was finally screened in C. elegans. Um, so this is uh, examples of reverse screening. So uh, that ends the drug discovery part. I'm going to move on to the biomarkers. Uh, so there are many different types of biomarkers. Uh, you have, for example, safety biomarkers, uh, liver enzymes, for example. When you screen new drugs, you want to see if those drugs do not cause toxicity to the liver. You can do that by monitor uh, liver enzymes. Uh, you have also prognostic uh, biomarkers, for example, that will allow you to predict the clinical cause of a disease as well as diagnostic biomarkers that allow you to diagnose a disease. But the things that we are interested in here are the surrogate biomarkers, the one that actually can be used as endpoints of clinical trials to show that an intervention actually works in humans. So what is uh, what are a good criteria for a biomarker of aging? Uh, there was this paper two years ago uh, in GeroScience where these four um, criteria were proposed. Uh, the American Federation of Aging Research has proposed uh, four other uh, criteria, but they largely overlap with these criteria. So first of all, um, what you want is that you have uh, something that you can measure relatively cheaply, easily, non-invasively in humans, that you can measure more than once in humans. So it doesn't require like tissue samples through biopsies or things like that. So often blood-based will be ideal for this. Uh, but the uh, measurement must also be reliable uh, and uh, it must also be very reproducible. Um, then the second thing you want is that it's very relevant to aging, obviously, uh, and also that uh, specific diseases that are not related to aging do not disturb this biomarker too much, so that there are no specific diseases where the biomarker suddenly goes haywire. Um, it's uh, very robust and consistent in its ability to predict all cause mortality, as well as clinical and functional outcomes. And finally, you want, of course, if you are going to use this as a, a validated endpoint in a clinical trial, it must actually be able to not only show responsiveness to an intervention, but actually predict that this intervention then is going to uh, extend lifespan. So, um, the biomarker field is really booming. And so here, total number of papers in PubMed, uh, and it's growing, obviously. But here in blue, you see the number of uh, new biomarker papers. And it's actually growing at a much faster rate than the total number of papers in PubMed, showing that there is actually quite a lot of interest in biomarkers in general. Uh, when we look at biomarkers of aging, and so I just screened PubMed with the term aging, uh, both in British and American English, uh, and uh, uh, biomarker, um, then this is what you find. Uh, of course, this is missing exhaustive uh, search because it ignores everything uh, where the um, search term will be biomarker of aging. That will not be included here. But you can anyway see that uh, the number of papers on uh, aging biomarkers is really increasing over time, and it has really exploded in recent years. And when you then look at all these papers individually, you find quite a lot of different biomarkers in them that have been proposed. 
Some of them have been discussed, of course, today, like uh, the anime mutilation um, and the photo age clock, for example. Uh, but the one that uh, I would like, and the reason I want to talk about that one is because it's probably the one that you might not have heard about. It's not a very popular or well-known one. So what is N-glycosylation? Uh, it's a code translational modification uh, that happens in the endoplasmatic reticulum. Uh, it's when uh, this uh, mannose structure is attached to an asparagin residue of a protein. And about 50% of proteins have these types of glycosylation modifications, particularly proteins that are secreted by the cell. Or, uh, so after uh, being modified in the endoplasmatic reticulum, it gets translocated to the Golgi, where a lot more modifications happen to this glycan structure. And then, of course, from the Golgi, it goes to where it needs to be. So how do you measure them? There are many methods out there uh, based on HPLC, based on mass spectrometry. However, uh, I decided here to uh, stick myself to one method that is actually a method that is very high complex equipment. And this method only requires two microliters of blood. So very small sample size. So you take a little bit of blood, you cut off first all the proteins, uh, so that ends up with free glycans. You label them with this fluorescent dye. Then you remove the sialic acid groups. Uh, the reason is they are negatively charged, so they will interfere with your separation. You only want a, a separation based on this fluorescent dye, which has three negative charges to it, as you can see here. Uh, and then you use a uh, capillary uh, electrophoresis uh, DNA sequencer, so the, the classical Sanger sequence type machine to actually separate these. And then you end up with a, a chromatogram of uh, different uh, glycan peaks. Now, this is not the most uh, sensitive method compared to HPLC methods, but it is a method that is very easy and available to a, a lot of labs. Lots of labs have these uh, Sanger sequences. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's feasible to do in a bigger clinical trial. So uh, what you then see if you compare young with old is mainly actually peak number six. And these are the two uh, glycans that correspond with peak number one and peak number six. Uh, they are both B antennary uh, glycans. Um, and so you can see they are also related to each other, namely that this one has actually uh, the halactosidase uh, removed uh, from the end of them. And when you then take the ratio of these two, uh, peak one divided by peak six, and you take the logarithm of that, you end up with what is being called the glyco H test. So um, why uh, are they interesting to, to use? Uh, as I already mentioned, it can be done in a very small sample size of two microliters. It can be done both in plasma and serum. It can be done on frozen samples and you need very little equipment. So that means it fulfills the first criterion. It's also very robust. So when you repeat the measurement, it stays stable. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of technical variation. The second criteria, is it linked to aging? Yes. So here you see data from uh, the Chinese, the Belgium and the Italian population. And you see in the Chinese population, both in males and females, an increase in peak one, an increase in peak two, and in uh, females, you see a very strong decrease in peak six, but not in peak uh, in uh, males. Uh, and then in uh, the Belgium and the Italian population, when you make this ratio of peak one and to peak six, you see it increasing all the way up to uh, centenarians. Uh, I should mention that it stays relatively uh, constant until you are in your 40s to 50s, and it's only thereafter that you really see it increasing. So uh, then is it also linked to clinical uh, outcomes? Yes. So if you look at people with dementia, they have higher glyco age scores than uh, similar age controls who are healthy. And when you look at uh, people who have Cockeye syndrome, which is a, a defect uh, in transcription uh, uh, um, uh, related uh, um, um, 
uh, NEC, uh, uh, nucleotide uh, exact uh, repair, uh, you actually uh, see that those people have much higher LACO-H test scores compared to uh, the healthy controls, even they score as high as uh, uh, people in their 90s. So uh, can interventions do anything about it? Uh, there is very little uh, data in the literature about this at the moment. There is one unpublished my study on calorie restriction that apparently shows it does. This is another uh, study on calorie restriction. Uh, sadly, in this study, the only compare uh, that they did is uh, CR compared with an, a medium fat diet, so not a real control diet. Uh, but you can see that uh, there was a significant decrease in the calorie restriction group in peak one. And as you remember, peak one is a peak that actually increases with age compared to the animals that had uh, a medium fat diet. And you actually can see here, if you uh, keep animals on CR and you switch them to a medium fat diet for uh, four months, then actually it falls in between these two, but that didn't reach significance. Uh, peak six is maybe a little bit surprising because with age, uh, at least in females, in human females, it decreases. And uh, actually here CR decreases it further. So that kind of suggests that peak one is actually a much better measurement of aging than peak number six. So uh, what are the remaining questions in this field? Uh, first, uh, do interventions other than calorie restriction slow down aging? Uh, that slow down aging decreases glycol age? Um, is the glycol age accelerated in other progeroid diseases uh, and just not only in Kokai syndrome? Does the glycol age correlate with aging in cell types that do not secrete significant quantities of glycoproteins because most of them are secreted by the liver or by the B cells? A lot of um, antibodies, um, IgGs, are uh, strongly glycosylated, but uh, your kidneys, for example, or your brain will not secrete glycoproteins in secretion. Uh, in, in the bloodstream, I mean. So uh, can the glycoH test actually measure aging of these organ systems? Of course, the fact that you see an uh, increase in glycoH in uh, people with dementia suggests that that might be the case, but uh, it needs further confirmation. Uh, are there other disease conditions that could actually interfere with the measurements of glycoH is unknown? And can it be used in species other than uh, humans or in, in mice, obviously? So let's conclude. Um, it's a promising yet understudied biomarker of aging. It fulfills criteria number one, for sure. Uh, it probably also meets criteria number two. And the other two criteria, they are, well, maybe met. And they need a lot more uh, evidence to really validate them. And so the end point is to go to validate the surrogate endpoints for these longevity therapeutics. Um, the problem, of course, remains the validation of the surrogate, which has to be really strongly validated. Um, and that's going to be difficult. And we can also conclude that not a single uh, biomarker will uh, measure biological age across all the tissues. So you will have to go to composite biomarkers. And for example, I just took a random recent paper that talked about uh, uh, a meta clock for uh, based on, on epigenetic clocks. So, uh, but there are other papers out there that uh, develop other composite biomarkers. So, thank you, and uh, I will take questions. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Uh, there's one question I think uh, from uh, from Rakesh: uh, How many DNA methylation biomarker companies are currently there, and uh, is there a gold standard biomarker, in your opinion? Uh, well, I don't know how many biomarker companies there are out there, uh, to be honest. Uh, is there a gold biomarker? No, not yet. Uh, but I think that, of course, the methylation clock is probably, at the moment, one of the most advanced ones. Uh, but also functional measurements, right, like hand grip strength and things like that really do correlate very well with mortality. So I think they are the ones that are the furthest, but there are many upcoming ones that are very interesting. Another question from Aubrey, how are glico age and glican age related? Oh, uh, so they are, uh, it's interesting because I didn't mention glycan age, but it's, uh, it's another one by uh, another uh, research group. Um, they didn't use peak number six, I think, for uh, cor correction. They, they uh, 
they looked at some others, but I don't recall exactly which uh, glycan structures they looked at, but they were just a few other glycan structures. Okay, thank you, thank you, Sven.